My name is Eric Mutel. By night, I'm a professional jazz musician, but by even later at night, I investigate the paranormal. I, along with my team, travel the country investigating all things paranormal. This is Eric Mintel Investigates. Uh, on today's show, it's absolutely incredible. Um, I'm here with Bill Burns, and our guest today is the one and only Yuri Geller, who is going to tell us a lot of great, great stories, but we're really going to talk about John Lennon's 1974 UFO sighting in New York City and the aftermath of some of what happened. So, Yuri, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much, Eric and Bill. I'm in Old Jaffa in Israel, which is very uh, close to Tel Aviv. Okay. And um, after 48 years of living overseas, my wife and myself, we decided to come back to our homeland. So we live now in Israel and I'm creating the Uri Geller Museum, which will be a, quite an amazing experience. And uh, although COVID-19 took the world by surprise, I'm still working hard to open the museum in uh, two or three months from now. That's fantastic. I saw some of that on, on uh, Instagram and uh, it looks really, really cool. Thank you. You must be very proud. Yes, I am because, uh, you know, I was born in Israel. I'm, in a, you know, a, I'm a Zionist, if you want to call it. I am um, a man of peace. And uh, throughout my career, probably you, you've heard of it. I've worked with, in the beginning, with Mossad. Mossad didn't understand how I bring them very valuable information. They probably didn't have the right computerized tools to test my brain with electrodes. So they called the CIA. And um, I left Israel in 1972. I was tested by the CIA and um, then uh, five years working with them. And I'm very proud that about two years ago, actually the CIA released a very powerful endorsement. I know I'm showing off a bit, but I will read it out to you because it's on the CIA's website, mm -hmm. the official website. They basically concluded, and this is, I quote now, as a result of Geller's success, in this experimental period, we consider that he has demonstrated his paranormal perceptual ability in a convincing and unambiguous manner. CIA. Now, if you don't believe this, just go to the official CIA website and read it for yourselves. But you know, um, Eric and Bill, I've been shrouded in controversy through, throughout all my life. So I'm very, a very controversial individual. Yuri, were you part, um, did you participate back in the 70s with uh, Hal Putoff and, um, uh, and the folks um, testing Ingo Swan for the remote viewing program? Yes, absolutely. I arrived at SRI in 1972. I met Ingo there. Uh, by the way, Ingo was a great painter. And uh, Hal Putoff was there. Russell Targ was there. And, and lots of other scientists, they all had links, direct links to the CIA and the American Defense Department. And uh, it was quite incredible because the official SRI film, which is basically the CIA's film, is available to see on my website, uh, which is urigeller.com. Uh, they were so shocked by what they have seen that they started suspecting that I might be able, and this is, the, you know, I, I might sound like I'm taking this out of a science fiction film, but it's, it's true. They were so concerned that my mind could trigger a nuclear weapon that they actually took me to the Lawrence Livermore radiation labs where they build atomic bombs to see what my mind can do to a trigger. From there, I was taken to the American Naval Surface Weapons Center in Baltimore. But throughout my life, I was constantly being tested by uh, government uh, agencies and worked for a few government agencies. But um, I have incredible stories to tell you, especially one by NSA. We all know NSA's National Security Agency but I'll tell that a little later. What else do you want to know? Well, oh, first of all, you're, what's fascinating to me is 
since you knew Ingo Swan, and we'll get into the John Lennon story in a second, but since you knew Ingo Swan, uh, just Ingo Swan told some incredible stories about going up to Alaska, about seeing ETs, extra, um, he called them aliens in, um, on the west side of Los Angeles. Uh, he told some phenomenal stories. That the, the, the story, that, I mean, and I knew him because after the uh, day after Roswell, the Phil Corso book came out. Um, he contacted me to share with me stories that um, that Phil had told that he wanted to corroborate as, yeah, that happened to me too. The, the, I think the most incredible story that he told me, and I'm wondering what you think about this, is he said that he was remote viewing the lunar surface. And when he was remote viewing the lunar surface, he was seeing... A, a, almost like a factory, an assembly line, and he was seeing entities, humanoid entities, and he said one of them picked up its head and looked at him, and Ingo said he had this really disturbing feeling that even though this was remote viewing, that entity could see him, and I'm wondering if he ever told you that story. Look, we are talking about almost 50 years ago. Yeah. He told me, he told me lots of stories, but to me, such a story um, wouldn't be surprising because I'm a huge believer in extraterrestrials. I'm a huge believer in aliens and UFOs. I've never seen an alien, but I have seen UFOs. So did millions of people. But I did have incredible experiences with Dr. Andrea Puharic. Oh, that's what I was going to ask you, Puharic. I'm reading your mind. Uh, he, <laughs> sent, uh, he was sent to Israel by Captain Edgar Mitchell Mm -hmm. who was the sixth man to walk on the moon. I later on became very close to Ed, very, very close. Actually, in the, my museum, I'll have a few artifacts that he gave me. I have his overall, NASA overall. I have incredible stuff happened between um, us, the scientist, Ed Mitchell, Andre Puharic. So uh, for me, talking about extraterrestrials and aliens looking at you is no big deal. You know, when I was about five years old, here in Israel, I had an encounter. I, I still don't know what exactly it was, but I was playing in an Arabic garden and I heard kittens cry. I was looking for them and suddenly out of nowhere, I saw a huge orb, a sphere of light. It was strobing. And the next thing I can remember is a laser beam kind of a ray emanated out of this orb, hit my forehead. It was so powerful that it pushed me into the grass. I don't know how long I lay there, but then I ran home to tell my mom. She didn't believe me. She thought I was either, I, I either dreamt it or I was lying. Or, But this was such a powerful experience that I, I never denied it. I always spoke about it in all my television interviews, radio, magazines. Uh, every time they interviewed me, I brought that story up. Now, for decades, I was the only one who was telling this story. But 10 years ago, when a BBC documentary was playing in Israel, and I was relaying this story, I get an email the next day from a retired Air Force officer who told me the following, Uri, I saw you last night on BBC here in Israel. I can't believe it, but I was there. I saw you. I saw the sphere of light. And I, I, you know, I immediately jumped on the phone and I interrogated him. And it was incredible because he was a young soldier in the, in the Air Force walking uh, on uh, Rothschild Boulevard. I, and on the right side was this Arabic garden. And he was walking to his uh, parents' home. And he saw me. Well, you know, he claims that it was me, and I'm sure it was, because he described this huge sphere of light burning, and I'm running to my flat over this, across the street, and this thing followed me, and it exploded on the facade of our building. We lived in Bezalel Street, number 13, and it kind of darkened the facade. I was so... Uh, you know, I was so taken back and amazed because for the first time in my life, someone actually validated an experience, an encounter that I had that I 
I was the only witness, but there was an Israeli Air Force officer who has no interest to lie. You wrote this article, um, I think it was in the Daily Mail or the Telegraph, about the experience, that's when we're going to jump to that, about the experience that uh, John Lennon had in the Dakota, not just what he saw the flying saucer with May Pang, but also you told the story of when John Lennon late at night heard saw a light behind his door, opened it, and it was a shocking thing because he saw actual little short extraterrestrials. Could you uh, 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 retell that story that you told? In yes, he, I was living on 57th Street uh, and 1st Avenue, and he lived in the Dakota building, which I would say I, I'm a runner. So to run from 57th Street and First Avenue to the Dakota building would take me maybe 12, 13 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. One day, one night, he wakes me up in the middle of the night and he says, Uri, Uri, I've got to see you. I've got to talk to you now. I said, now, John, I'm sleeping. No, 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 come now. So I quickly dressed up, you know, we were close. Let me explain you my connection with John. Uh, uh, in, in the very early 70s, Elton John asked me to convince John to perform with him in Madison Square Garden. Uh, actually, it's in Elton John's uh, book called Me. And uh, I, I guess Lennon had a stage fright or he, did ju he just didn't want to get on stage. And uh, John told me, well, if you get this girl back into my life, I will do it. Anyhow, to make a long story short, the girl came back into his life and uh, Elton and John Lennon brought the house down in Madison Square Garden. Uh, so I, I knew these guys. Remember, I was on an ego trip then. I was after fame and fortune. I wanted to be a psychic rock star. So I was right next to Studio 54 with mixing with David Bowie and Mick Jagger, uh, everyone. And um, we really became very close because um, although they knew superstars, but I was different. I was, I bent spoons with the power of my mind. I read minds. I was a freak. I was, I was just someone who they wanted to explore because they had everything. They had money, they had fame. Everyone knew who they were, but they wanted to know where I come from. What's is it spiritual? Is it psychic? Is it extraterrestrial? So that's how my friendship uh, was uh, began with John. So I meet John. I believe it was a Sherry Netherland hotel, and there was a thick curtain. We get it behind the thick curtain. We draw it close, and John says to me, "Look, Uri, I'm lying in my bed in the Dakota building, and suddenly the door opens, and a creature comes close to my bed." And telepathically, I commanded to stretch my hand out. And this um, alien, I, you know, it's hard for me to remember the exact words, gives me something. And John pulls out of his pocket a very strange, uh, small bronze-like egg. Uh, it's very, it's super heavy. It's much heavier than what it looks like. And he says, I want you to keep this. I want you to have it. <clears throat> for the rest of your life. So basically, that was his story. And, um, you know, I carry the object with me wherever I go. And I'm going to display it in the museum. And, uh, yeah, he was a huge believer. He's, he's, see, he's seen UFOs, I believe he... I, I actually own a drawing, one of his very rare UFO drawing that uh, John drew. From the night that he saw the, uh, the craft, was that the one of them? I, I don't know when he drew the drawing, but but um, I, I I'm the owner of one of his UFO drawings, and he didn't draw many UFOs. Let me tell you something about this. Do you realize this happened decades ago? Mm -hmm. Do you know that you know I get about 300 emails a day and about 400 WhatsApps every week? I get asked this question from, from all over the world, from Japan, from, from Indonesia, from America, from Peru, from China. Uri Geller, why, why on earth are you not 
testing this object, why don't you give it to a team of scientists so they can prove once and for all that it is made from a, no, a non-Earth made material? And do you know what I answer them? I do not want to test this. I do not want to test this object because I do not want to be disappointed that it's made in Taiwan. I want to believe in John Lennon's words. Well, of course, you know what that reminds me of when you tell that story of Lennon giving you that. That reminds me of another story from what, six, 600 years ago, 400, 500 years ago. It's the story of John Dee and Edwin Kelly and the angels giving John Dee the egg-shaped device that allows him to translate the alphabet so he can speak to the aliens. I mean, that's when, when I read that story, that's what it struck me. That's how it struck me. I'll tell you something very interesting that has a link to this. By the way, I'm sure you know of Gaia TV, but to, to those who are listening to this program now, um, I urge you to go to Gaia and watch my four, four interviews because uh, when I was, I, the, the CIA instilled me into uh, Mexico. I had some missions to do there. You know, uh, Mexico City has the largest Russian uh, listening uh, post. The Russian embassy there is a big spying center. So I had some missions to do for the CIA in Mexico, and they wanted me to get very close to the president of Mexico, and they arranged that. So I found myself in Los Pinos, which was the um, Mexican White House. And I got very friendly with President Lopez Portillo. Uh, the president arranged me to see the pyramids uh, because he wanted me to see a special um, amazing slab. And you both probably know about it, where you actually see an astronaut etched into the stone, mm -hmm. sitting in a capsule. Right, that's and the very famous ancient astronauts, yeah. Exactly. Now. Then I was, then the president blew my mind because he told me to come to Los Pinos. You know, this is, this is incredible. It's like in the movies, uh, he said, you know, they sent the soldiers to pick me up in a limousine. Uh, I always had bodyguards and all that. And then he takes me to a small room in Los Pinos and he walks over to a safe and he opens the safe and he takes out a rock crystal skull of an extraterrestrial and the reason i translate it to an extraterrestrial it be because the skull has an elongated uh brain it's a, 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 so i i'm holding it in my hand in the gaia interview in which we it'll also be in my uh museum i, so I was so shocked and i asked uh, i asked jose i called him Jose, uh, where did you get this from? He said it was found in the pyramid. And we are talking about a rock crystal skull that must be, what, between two and a half and 4,000 years old. And he gave it to me. Wow, I, you know why, when I'm telling you this story, I get goosebumps. But uh, the, the connection here is this, that two years ago, when I was standing in the building that I purchased, to create the Uri Geller Museum. The building must be at least 600 years old, maybe a thousand years old. I felt that there's something under the, the ground. It was, you know, the ground was earth. Now it's all uh, tiled. So I called up the Israeli Antiquity Department because you're not allowed to just to dig. They have to give you permission. So they sent a lady to guard and they, I, I got the permission to dig because I told them that I feel that there's something under the floor under the ground. Hmm. Lo and behold, we discovered um, an ancient olive oil soap factory. Uh, so it's now all exposed and you know, I'm, I'm, I'll have a little video talking about this. Why did I bring all this up? Because Ingo Swan, we're going back now to Ingo Swan, uh, had the ability to remote view uh, am amazingly. I, I couldn't do what Ingo did. And Ingo also was so, um, he was so sharp in his artistic manner of painting. He was incredibly skilled uh, that he could paint 
what he remote viewed. And I believe that there are some painting of his of uh, Mars and, and the moon. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you know, listen, Eric and Bill, what's a big deal? I mean, come on, of course they're extraterrestrials. I mean, if, if they weren't, then what a waste of space out there. Well, and the other thing too, Uri, is, is um, not just who they are, but why they are and what's their relationship oh. to us and would a full revelation of our history with them just blow apart religions and governments and things like that, which is what one of the people told me from who worked at Skunk Works. It won't blow religion away because the Bible and the Quran and the Hindu scriptures are riddled with stories of this nature. I mean, look at the paintings uh, of master painters of five, six hundred years ago. You know, I also own, this is another incredible story. Eric, am I not blabbering away here? Not no, go ahead, Yuri, please. No. Okay. Talk no, about what you uh, own. This is your okay. show. In the, in, <laughs> in, the, in the early 70s, I, uh, Salvador Dali heard about me. And, you know, Salvador Dali was the, uh, the father of serialism. Yeah. And he couldn't believe that a young man from Israel with long dark hair can bend spoons with his mind. And the reason he wanted to meet me is I, I believe that in 1936, he painted a bent spoon. Uh, and uh, so if you Google uh, Dali's bent spoon, it'll come up. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I met Dali, we became very close. I'm, I'm a painter myself. And one day in, the Barce in Barcelona, uh, he calls me into his room in the hotel and he says, I want, you, I want to give you a gift. He walks into his bedroom and he comes out holding a crystal globe, a, a, a nice, beautiful, uh, you know, orb. And it is rock crystal and he hands it to me and he says to me, Uri, I want you to have this. This belonged to Leonardo da Vinci. Hmm. Now, of course, I, I didn't believe him. I smiled, but I pretended. I said, oh, Dali, uh, you're not serious. Are you really giving me this? But it belonged to Leonardo da Vinci. Come on, you should keep this. He says, no, 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 I want you to have it. Wow. I couldn't believe it. I called Israel, but the car was already here. I sent my friend to immediately take it off the car. And yeah. um, so, so I have it. Do you have any theories about why John Lennon was murdered? Oh, well, come on. You know, in America, there are what? 310 million handguns. Uh, how many mentally, in, uh, you know, mentally sick people are there among how many people now are in America? 340 million, can yeah. you tell me? Sure, but so, I mean, just I guess the question for me is the one thing that stood out, and I'm wondering about this. It's the one. First of all, you know all the conspiracy theories surrounding the yeah. murder of John Lennon, right? That yeah, because yeah. John Lennon gave you the device from an alien, that the uh, the powers that be believed that the aliens had communicated with Lennon through this device, and that's why he was killed. And so, uh, Mark David Chapman was programmed to kill Lennon. I don't believe that, but that's uh, one of the conspiracy theories. You know, Bill and er er Eric, I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to penetrate into severe conspiracy theories. But by the way, I'm, I'm also a huge believer in life after death. You know, there's no doubt in my mind that, um, you know, there's reincarnation. No doubt that Lennon is with Michael Jackson and Frank Sinatra and Elvis Presley. And they're having fun in that different dimension. And we'll all you know, meet Thomas Edison already agrees with you. Thomas Edison <laughs> believed that everything that exists is composed of things called life units. I think they're probably interchangeable with electrons, but they're life units. And he believed that the human consciousness, like Roger Penrose, that the human consciousness did not dissipate after death, did not die with the body. And he actually came up with uh, a schematic for an invention that would ping 
the life units of the recently departed. I don't know if it ever worked. I know how we built it, but the, uh, um, the, the the Edison uh, ghost phone. Yeah, the Edison ghost phone. That was uh, that and was written up in Modern Mechanics in the 1920s, and he actually, yes. And who are we? And who are we to argue with Edison? Uh, look, uh, we didn't go into Tesla. We didn't go into quantum mechanics and quantum entanglement, which is basically, are you creating me now for this interview or am I creating you? Do we at all exist? But let me just complete this interview with that very far out NSA story. Okay. Um, I was also tested by MI5 in London with um, very distinguished scientists from the rocket industry. They even brought in Arthur C. Clarke who, um, you know, wrote 2001 Space Odyssey. I have pictures with Arthur C. Clarke. I bent his keys. He freaked out. <laughs> and uh, I did a poltergeist. I dematerialized one object from point A to another room, to point B. So it kind of go went through the wall. Now, MI5 created that uh, experiment. So they had to... Um, divulge it to the CIA and the CIA had to relay this story to NSA National Security Agency now listen the NSA were so impressed now look on my website the NSA released about three years ago top secret papers that they had for decades uh, I'll, make, I'll make it very short they wanted to to create 10 Uri Gellers. They said, if Uri Geller can dematerialize a little object from point A to point B, then what can 10 Uri Gellers do? So the task was, and you can read it on my website, directly from the NSA documents. They wanted us to, and sit down now, to dematerialize a city in Russia. <laughs> this is true. You know, you will decipher yourselves word by word the document from NSA. Anyhow, listen, guys, it was such a pleasure to be with you both. Absolutely. You, Ori, and again, thank you so much. Uh, and Bill, thank you. You know, this has been phenomenal. And, you know, you have been one, you were probably the one of the first guys to really bring paranormal to a wide audience and yeah you know eric you know that you're interviewing me today and you you bill not because of my powers but because of not because of what i am but because of who i am and you know why i'm still relevant because i'm controversial the secret of success is originality and people still debate, you know, the skeptics, the magicians. Um, I, I'm, I'm still very, very controversial, especially if I come uh, with these type of stories about ET and extraterrestrials and so on. So the people who actually created me and the aura around me and the mysteriousness, the strangeness are the skeptics. Mm. So I really have to thank them for creating the debate around me. Otherwise, I would have been a long time forgotten. Listen, I love you both. And a big hug from me to all your um, listeners, to your audiences worldwide. And Uri, have a wonderful year. Thank have you. Have a sweet new year. Thank you. Bless you both. All right, bless, bless you. Bye-bye.